face anything like this again. So we've got to stay as humble and as focused and as passionate for Jesus as we've ever been in our lives. Because how many believe his coming is soon? And how many want to be ready when he comes? Again, guys, I don't even know what to say except thank you. And I, you know, while you're standing, I'm just going to do this right now. To be honest, I'm so gr- I, I, we couldn't do this without a team. And next Sunday, I'm going to honor all of our pastors and leaders, and we're going to celebrate them. How many are grateful for the leadership we have here at Church Alive? Our amazing pastors, our elders, our deacons, our ministry leaders, everybody serving with all of their heart, and they're doing it for Jesus. They're doing it because they love you and they love the Lord, and we're so grateful for everyone. But there's somebody that stands out from the crowd that really Church Alive couldn't do what we do without her right in the middle of everything. And Sherry, I've known you for a long time, and I've watched you and Eric I watch watch God transform your life. I watch God transform Eric's life. When When I first met you, I could see God's hand on your life, and I knew what a wonderful person you were. And, of course, I've known Eric since we were just young guys. But I see every day your growth, your courage, your integrity, impeccable. And listen, impeccable integrity. And just the way that you serve willingly and wholeheartedly. You never do anything haphazardly. You always do it well. And so we want to honor you. We have something for you. Would you, would you and Eric come? Where, where, where's Eric at? There he is. Listen, I love this guy so much right here. I knew I had to sell my guitar. <clears throat> But I've had that guitar since I was nine years old. My grandma got it for me. It is a Kurt Cobain Mustang Finger, a Fender, Finger, Mustang Fender guitar. And when I saw Eric up there playing it a couple of Sundays ago, my eyes got, actually during conference, my eyes got filled with tears because I knew it was in good hands and it was going to honor God the rest of its life. And so would you guys join me and let's honor Sherry and Eric Wilcox. All right, all right, all right. Uh, just one more thing. Have you got a Bible? Just remain standing. Let me let me ask you this. Would you guys be okay? And I know it's some of you are in a hurry. If I can get you out of here by 1230, that's 30 minutes. Will, will, you, will you work with me on that? How many can, how many can stay for half uh, another half hour? Okay. If you, if you can't stay, you can't leave because you can't get out of the parking lot. So stay with me. Let the the little kids. Oh, I need to run the little kids out of here. Can you go to your class? Is that Anna? (laughs) Hi, gorgeous. (laughs) She'd rather be with Maggie. (laughs) Today is also Gina's birthday. Gina, happy birthday. Turning 29 again. 29 again. (laughs) Happy birthday. All right, if you got your Bibles, we're in Genesis. I'm Genesis. I'm all over the board today. No, we're in Malachi. We're about as far from Genesis as you can get and stay in the Old Testament. Everybody say Malachi. Malachi chapter 3. I'm going to read just two verses. Then we're going to pray and jump right into the Word this morning. Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 6, he says, For I am the Lord, and I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances, and you have not kept them. Return. Everybody say return. Return. 
I love this statement. He says, return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Circle that statement, the Lord of hosts, because this is the key terminology that God uses to describe himself through this entire book of Malachi. says the Lord of hosts, but you have said in what way shall we return? Bow your hearts and let's pray together today. Father, thank you for this moment that we have. And Lord, I'm truly so humbled that you have honored me to serve your people. Lord, that you have trusted me with their care for 23 years. And God, help me to be faithful, to live up to the expectation that you have put on me. Thank you for every leader Thank you, Lord, for every volunteer, for every servant leader. Lord, thank you for every person that has helped lay the foundation. Thank you for every person that is building the house. And Lord, thank you in advance for the next generation that will rise up and continue to share the gospel until the Lord's return. Let your blessing continue to increase abundantly upon Church Alive, upon Iglesia Viva, on any other ministries, God, that you are going to birth out of this place. We prophesy blessing over it in advance and declare that this is a season of growth, of increase, of multiplication, of souls being added to the kingdom. Bless the word today. Speak to our hearts. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. And a man. You can be seated. This morning I'm going to, and I really, I'm going to be honest with you, that's really not the cover that I wanted. I thought I had changed that. That was my initial cover. I thought I changed it. But apparently I didn't hit save. So I'm not quite sure what we're going to get with a PowerPoint today, but it's going to be interesting. Um, look at your neighbor and say, Honorable. Come on, look at the, at the other neighbor and say honorable. honorable. I'm going to break that down. Everybody say honor able. honor, able. Now look back at that first neighbor and tell him this. Say you're able, you're able. To, honor. to honor. Now tell the person on the other side one more time. Said you're able, you're able. To, honor. to honor. I want to talk to you today about honorable. I want to lay a quick foundation, then I want to get into the heart of this passage here in the book of Malachi. The nation of Israel has returned from the Babylonian captivity. They have been back into the land of Israel for somewhere between 90 and 100 years. The temple has been rebuilt. The walls have been restored. This little nation that God called the light of the nations is beginning to rebound and prosper. However, they soon begin to wax cold in their relationship with God. In spite of the fact that God was blessing them and they were no longer in slavery and captivity, they had returned to their homeland and their crops were beginning to grow. They had built homes. They had restored the temple. They had rebuilt the city. In spite of all of the good stuff that, were, that was happening, they were focusing upon things that they expected to happen that had not yet occurred. You see, they believed that the Messiah would come and he would establish his kingdom and that he would bring peace and prosperity. And when that didn't happen on their timetable, they began to murmur and complain and focus on the negative rather than the positive. Now here God was blessing them. God was restoring them. Miraculously, he had provided everything that they needed, and yet they were focused on what they didn't have because the blessing that they did have was not as plentiful as they had anticipated. So they began to question the prophecies of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Haggai and Joel and Hosea. And they were, they were claiming that they were not coming to pass and the nation was falling into spiritual lukewarmness. I don't have time to pursue this. I will simply say there's always good things and bad things happening in your life simultaneously. 
And you have to decide what you're going to focus on. How many understand life is not perfect? There's always a battle and there's always a victory to celebrate. There's always something going on. You are constantly in a process of transition and you've got to decide where you're going to put your focus and your energy. If you only focus on what you don't have and you never celebrate what you do have, you will never develop an attitude of gratitude, honor, and appreciation. Can somebody put an amen on that today? Now, what's interesting about this is they are still worshiping. They're still going through all the motions of sacrifice and spiritual observance, yet because their hearts were not in it. He says, you worship me with your lips, but your heart is far from me because their heart was not in it. They were dishonoring God. And by dishonoring God, They were cutting off the very blessings that they were murmuring about not having. Their dishonor for God cut off the flow of his blessing in their lives. And so God raises up this prophet to speak to the nation, to call them to account for where they were spiritually. Now the book of Malachi is an interesting book. How many have ever read the whole book of Malachi? Wave at me. There's about 10 of you, 12 of you, and maybe a few more than that. Let's, let, let, let's, let's say the majority of people have never read the book. I encourage you to take time and read the entire book of Malachi because it is so interesting. And once you understand this message, you'll see it in its context. The entire book of Malachi is a discourse that takes place, a conversation that occurs between God and his people. He's asking rhetorical questions. How many know what a rhetorical question is? Let me explain for those that didn't raise their hand. A rhetorical question is a question that you ask that's not designed to get an answer. It's designed to make somebody think. How many understand that when God asks you something, he's not lacking information? He's not looking for an answer. He's trying to get your attention. A rhetorical question would be like, well, some time ago I was dressed up. I was over here at Mark's. I was in a, I was in a black suit. And I'm walking through the store, and somebody from the church came by and said, oh, pastor, I, I've never seen you out in public in a suit before. I said, oh, yeah, I was preaching a funeral for this person. There. Did he die? <clears throat> no. This is rehearsal so that when he does... Everybody's going to know what to do. That's really not a rhetorical question. That's a silly question, but you get the point. A rhetorical question is when God says, is anything too difficult for me? He's not asking you to say no because he already knows the answer. How many are hearing what I'm talking about? So God asks these rhetorical questions, and he details a dispute that he has with them. And then what's amazing is God asks the questions, and then he answers them as though he is observing their actions and reading their minds. And then he gives a vindication so that he establishes the last word in every matter. Now, as you read through the book, this occurs, <clears throat> this occurs six times. The first three exposes their lukewarmness as a people. The last three confronts their actions and he demands change. Now, now hang on with me because it's going to get tight here for just a moment. And you might, you might want to um, reconsider your gift after I say this, but... It's important that you get this. He begins by addressing the priesthood, the spiritual leaders of the nation. He then addresses the people. God always starts with the leadership and then addresses the people. When the scripture says judgment will begin in the house of the Lord, in the context, he's not really referring to the people that are sitting in the seats. Excuse me. If I can get some water. I 
I'm going to keep that with me. I'm going to say that again. When God makes that statement, he's not necessarily referring to the congregation, to the saints, to the church in general. In the context, he's referring excuse me, to the leadership of the church. Everybody say this. Well, I'm going to finish. <laughs> Have you ever just had a tickle get in your throat? Hopefully it didn't happen when you were up speaking in front of the whole church. Everybody say this to me. Say, everything flows from the head down, from the top to the bottom. Say this with me also. Say, everything rises and falls on leadership or the lack thereof. Now, leadership in its purest sense is the ability to influence people to do what they otherwise would not do on their own. Say this with me one more time. Say, leadership, leadership. is influence. Leadership. So the reason God begins with the leaders is because they are responsible for setting the tone, establishing an example and providing the resources and the reinforcement for others to duplicate what they are doing. In other words, the idea of leading <clears throat> is that you do it first. A leader doesn't ask others to do what they're not willing to do. A leader is not a herder. How many are with me? A leader is a doer. They're setting the tone. They're establishing the example. Leaders establish a model for others to follow. Now hang with me for a moment because I know I'm struggling with, with my voice here, but I'll work through this. Just hang with me. There's a passage of Scripture that's not in your notes. It's not on the PowerPoint, but I want you to write this down. Luke chapter 6. Verse number 40 is a verse of scripture. Now look at me and don't miss this. This scripture haunts me. I think about this on a continual basis. And I want to drop something in your spirit today. If you feel a calling on your life, if you feel like God has anointed you or destined you to be a leader. I want you to catch this. Jesus makes a statement that has incredible impact. He says, and I'm going to drink some water before I say this. Everybody say Luke chapter 6. We will get this. Luke chapter 6 and verse number 40. Here's what Jesus says in that, in that passage. A student will become like their teacher if they're trained properly. There it is. They put it up in the New Living. But the student who is fully trained will become like the teacher. In other words, if the people that we're over are not becoming like us, we're not training them right. That's the first implication. The second implication is whoever you allow to speak and impart into your life is creating your future. Everybody shout influence. And so God knowing this, knowing that and I'm not going to be able to preach, I'm just going to talk. Knowing that leaders 
produce what they are, not necessarily what they teach. He calls them into account and he tells them, this is an amazing discourse. Because he tells them the depth of his love for them. He reminds them how he chose them and found them. That they were a nothing nation and he rescued them and brought them into covenant. And he blessed them and prospered them and protected them and made them a mighty people. He reminds them that he has called them his family. That he has blessed them immeasurably. And then he calls them to account for their actions. Here's the part that hits me so hard. He says to them in this book, I don't need your worship. I don't need your obedience. I don't need your reverence. I don't need your offerings in order to be God. I was God before you got here. I'll be God when you're God. I'm God whether you honor me and reverence me and worship me and serve me or not. I'll still be God. While eternity rolls, I'll still be God. I don't need any of this. I don't need your sacrifices. Because I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I don't need your obedience. At my word, nations change. I don't need your loyalty. I have an innumerable number of angels that will perform my every command. He says, but I want it because I love you. And because I have good things for your life. And because I know that I created you in such a way that life only works when you live it my way. And when you don't live it my way, it ends in train wreck. And he's saying to this nation, I don't need all of your observances, but I'm trying to bless you. I'm trying to heal you. I'm trying to give you happy marriages. I'm trying to make your life functional. I'm trying to heal your brokenness. I'm trying to lead you into all of these blessings. And if you'll just honor me, I'll show you blessings that are beyond your capacity to comprehend. You know, Pastor Sam, you know what bothers me the most as a pastor? I grieve over this. When I see people serve God as though they're prisoners of war, as though they're being forced to, compelled to, they're afraid of the pastor, they're afraid of the elder, they're afraid of the bishop. They're afraid of getting in trouble. They're afraid of being embarrassed. They're afraid of being called out. They're afraid of losing their title or their position. And so their heart is far from what they're doing. But they're just living it out. Some of them are afraid of going to hell. And so they practice certain things and they fail to understand the essence of what God is saying He's saying, when you dishonor me, you rob me of the joy of releasing the abundance of my blessings in your life. Look at your neighbor and tell him this, say, God has a blessing with your name on it. My God, I feel like preaching a little bit right now. Come on, tell somebody, say, God has a miracle with your name on it. God has a breakthrough with your name on it. Do you understand that right now while you're sitting in church alive in Cleveland, Ohio, the Bible says the eyes of the Lord are going to and fro throughout the whole earth right now today. The eyes of the Lord are walking up and down these aisles and he's moving in and out of these seats and he's looking for somebody to bless. He's looking for somebody to heal. He's looking for somebody to transform. And all he is waiting on is someone that will honor him. Honor. Everybody shout honor. Honor. He says, I've prepared all these blessings. All this goodness. And if you'll just honor me, 
because they had lost their awe and their honor for God, their worship had become listless and careless. I'm going to need five more minutes. Look at Malachi chapter 1, verse number 6. Look at this passage. It says, a man honors his father and a servant his master. If I am the father, then where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts to you priests who despise, notice this, who despise and show, everybody say contempt. Circle the word contempt. Literally the word contempt means dishonor. Because it's not sacred, because it's not holy, because you don't see it properly, you treat it carelessly. And you say, in what way have we despised your name? He says, you offer defiled food on my altar. But say, in what way have we defiled you? By saying the table of the Lord is contemptible. And I know I'm going to have to come back to this next Sunday, but i got to give you this. Because this is something I see happening in churches all over the world today. They had become so familiar with the things of God, they were treating the sacred as though it was ordinary and not honorable. They were bored with worship. It was a nuisance. Practice is too demanding. Faithfulness is too difficult. It's too inconveniencing to be committed. I've got a lot of stuff going on. It requires too much sacrifice and effort. The truth is, is we can get there too. Here's my question to you. Does God still take your breath away? Or have you just gotten used to it? How many remember when you were first saved? How many remember when the tears poured down your face and you knew the power of sin had been broken off of your life? How many have been baptized in the Holy Ghost? Wave at me. How many know the joy of speaking in other tongues and experiencing the touch of the Holy Spirit on your life? I want to take this a step further. Have any of you ever been slain in the Holy Ghost? I'm not talking about a courtesy fall. I'm not, I'm not talking about just laying down because somebody's pushing on you. I'm talking about experiencing the tangible, authentic presence of God in such a way that your physical body cannot contain it and you find yourself unable to stand up under the heaviness of His presence. How many have been in a worship experience kind of like what we were in today? I'm going to be honest with you. I've been in hundreds of services like this, but I never get tired of it. I, I, there's something about the presence of God. I, I'm sorry. I, I know it makes some people uncomfortable, but I'm going to lift my hands. I'm going to walk around a little bit because I can't stand still like a cigar store Indian when I think of how worthy and how awesome and how good he is and what he has done for me. Something inside of me begins to well up. And in the words of the the old folks, I have to shout hallelujah. Can somebody lift your hands up and praise God in this place today? And we have all had these encounters to some degree or another. But the reality is, is it's easy to become so familiar that it doesn't move us anymore. We hear the message of the cross and, oh, I know that. Do you know that they took nails the size of your index finger and forced them into his brow until his head swelled twice its normal size? Do you know that they took a whip and beat him until literally the flesh dangled from his bones? Do you know that they took the hair in his face and they plucked it and pulled out his beard until Isaiah said his face was so marred we would not even recognize him as a man? Do you realize after all that beating and all that punishment he was forced to carry his own cross 
all the way up Golgotha's hill? Do you know that they took spikes and they drove them in his arms and in his feet and they hung him upon a cross and they left him there to gasp for breath until he died. And when they were unsure if he was dead or not, they took a spear and they drove it into his side until the blood and the water gushed out. Do you also understand he didn't have to do that? He said, no man take my life, I give it. He said, one thing I asked of my father and he gave to me, he gave me the power to lay my life down and he gave me the power to pick it back up again. Angels were stationed to come to his rescue. But he stretched out his arms, submitted himself to the will of the Father, and finished his assignment. And someone said to me not long, not long ago, that's so bloody, I, I just get uncomfortable hearing it. See, here's the problem. It's like inviting Jesus over to your home for dinner and serving hot dogs and potato salad. Maybe run down to the gas station and get a little bit of coleslaw and put it on paper plates while you watch television and clip your nails and scroll on your cell phone. While Jesus sits as a guest in your home. And listen, I, I, I know I'm, I'm over my time, but I, I, here's my problem. I think sometimes we forget how good it is to be saved. To be forgiven. How many have messed up? How many are lying to me? Come on. How many have messed up? Hold your hand up. Take your hand down. How many have messed up today? How many have needed forgiveness today for something you said or something you thought or something you almost said or thought? <laughs> and I honestly think sometimes we just become like this nation. We have such a good dose of religion doesn't mean we're lost. doesn't mean we don't have a relationship with God. But we've lost our first love. He doesn't amaze us. He doesn't inspire us. He doesn't move us to emotion. We've just gotten used to Him. And so when we lose our awe of God, listen, when you lose your awe of God, it's because you're in awe of yourself. You know when you lose your hunger for Jesus? When you get full of yourself. Amen. And he's saying to this nation, you've lost your awe. You've lost your excitement. You've lost your passion. And so your worship is careless. You drag in late. You're unprepared. You didn't even get dressed. You just jumped out of bed in your pajamas. And put on some shoes and came to church. Listen, I'm glad you're here. But you're in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Take a shower. <clears throat> Comb your hair. Put on some cologne. Brush your teeth. Get your breath mint. Come in and get in the presence of God. Well, also you got to worship with other people and they appreciate that as well. But you get the idea. And again, listen, listen, I know this is contrary to the mentality of our culture that says come just as you are. And I say come just as you are, but don't keep coming like that. <laughs> understand, understand you have an audience with Jesus. And here's my concern, and, and, and I will move on after this and wrap this up, but here's my concern. I think that we've just gotten used to him. We've gotten used to good music. We've gotten used to, to Maverick City and Brandon Lake and Elevation and, and, I, and I, I don't know, um, K, K, 
Carrie Job or whoever it is that you listen to. And if the quality of the church worship team is not as good as the quality of the music on the radio that's been fine-tuned and edited in the studio, well, you just stay home and watch it online or something else. But the problem is we've gotten used to the presence of God and He doesn't move us anymore. And so our worship is casual. We give whenever we feel like it. We come whenever we want to show up. We worship when things are going right and when they're not, we're nowhere to be seen. And God is calling this nation and I believe God is calling us as a nation and He says you need to fall in love with Jesus again. You need to remind yourself of the depth of His love and what He's done in your life and where He's brought you from until you stand in His presence and the tears flow one more time. When I think of his goodness, I remember when we used to dance all night. I remember when I jumped until my legs were numb. Come on, is anybody listening to what I'm talking about? And I would even pray, Lord, don't let him sing that song again because I'm too tired. But we'd start and I'd start jumping one more time. Is anybody in this house in love with Jesus today? I'm going to wrap this up. Here's, I'll pick this up next week because that's the best part of the whole sermon. Here's the problem. When they lost their passion for God. Second thing that they did was they abandoned his commandments. And God rebukes them. I don't have time to go into all of this. God rebukes them because he said, because you've dishonored me, you know what you did next? You started dishonoring each other. Disrespecting someone because they look different, dress different, their skin tone's a little different, they live in a different neighborhood, they have a different experience, they're not one of us. Are they a human? Look at your neighbor and say, there's only one race. Tell them, say, lots of ethnicities. There's only one race. It's called the human race. Come on, is anybody with me in the house today? Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna get, I'm gonna milk every bit of these next two minutes. Because sometimes we get caught up in us versus them. And if you're not like me, if you don't think like me, if you don't dress like me, if you don't act like me, if you don't live in my neighborhood of the city, if you, if you don't listen to the same kind of music I listen to, if you worship a little bit different than I do, there's something wrong with you. We love to categorize people and label them so we can dishonor them. What we fail to realize is there's greatness that God's deposited in every one of us. Look at your neighbor say there's something in you that is needed in this body. Otherwise, the Holy Ghost wouldn't have put you here today. Every joint has something to contribute. Every person has something to offer. Our problem is, is when we dishonor and when we disrespect, we cut off the flow and can't receive what God sent as a package gift and put it right next to you. But because she's Puerto Rican. Or because he's African American. I even had someone say to me, I can't believe you finally had an Asian preacher come last Sunday. I said, that Asian preacher is one of my best friends in the whole world. What are you talking about? I stay in his home. I preach in his church. I speak at his conference. I know his kids' birthdays. His kids know my kids. I send birthday cards to his grandbabies. What are you talking about? That's one of my closest friends. Just because I'm white and red-headed with polka dots all over me <laughs> doesn't mean I don't recognize a gift from God when he sends it to me. And here's... Listen, 
And here was God's indictment against the people. He said, you've dishonored me, and the proof that you've dishonored me is you dishonor each other. And you talk trash about your brother and sister, and you get on Facebook, and you cut them down like they're worthless. And you call them names. You insult them. You won't sit by them in church. You won't invite them to your birthday party for your kids. Oh, you'll go to church with them, but you won't live life with them. He says, not only are you dishonoring one another, he said, but now you're exploiting the poor and the weak. You're preying upon the weak. Haven't we seen this in our culture? And listen, I, I don't mean to, to make anybody, well, if I make you mad, I'm sorry about this. But when, when you look at what's happened with, with, with some of the stuff that has been exposed, like with Epstein and with, uh, with uh, Sean Combs and so many others, and, and, and excuse me, almost speechless, you see the list of weak, vulnerable people who are being exploited. Did you know Cleveland is one of the hotbeds for human sex trafficking in the entire nation? Did you know we have 325,000 migrant children no one can account for? And a lot of them, unfortunately, are being exploited and used and victimized. What is he saying to us? As a church, he's saying when you dishonor God, the next thing that happens is you start dishonoring people. When you don't understand the value of God, then you start devaluing the people that I have brought into your life. And so it doesn't bother you to shoot somebody dead in the street. It doesn't bother you to watch violence on television until blood pours all over the place. And this, I'm going to make some of you upset. I hope you still love me when I'm done. We'll pay money to go to the theater and watch people get brutally ripped apart and dismembered in horror movies. And we'll laugh about it. How many still love me? I'm not saying don't watch horror movies. Well, maybe I am saying that. <laughs> But I'm saying there's something wrong and that doesn't bother you. There's something wrong and you can go by a person living on the street that's cold and they have no food and it doesn't move you. I'm not telling you to empty your wallet, but I'm telling you be compassionate. What I saw, and I, I'm sorry I'm going so long, but i got to preach what God has put in my spirit today. When I was down in North Carolina and Tennessee last week, and by the way, thank you for your generosity. And we went down there. I saw things that you cannot fathom with your eyes. They were still rescuing, or they were not rescuing, they were still finding bodies of dead people. And while we were there, they found a young man and woman in their early 30s that had two small children. Their car was still in drive as they were trying to get away from the flood. And the water drove, drug their bodies 26 miles down the river. And they were shredded like cheese. And they had to literally pick their body pieces up out of the rubble and out of the debris. And I saw this with my own eyes. I saw people who not only lost their home, they didn't just lose their home, but the land their home was on is completely washed away and now their yard is gone and their garden is gone and everything, their whole property is gone and there's no way to rebuild because what was once their home is now a riverbed. The reality is, is there are people they still haven't reached yet. And yet, we watch it on television it doesn't move us. What's the problem? We've forgotten what it's like to be lost and found. We've gotten used to being children of God. And when we stop honoring God, we stop valuing people. We stop caring for people. I'm going to make some folks really mad right now. Our political affiliation becomes more important than the relationships. <clears throat> 
that God brings into our lives. And we will hurt people and cut them off because they don't see the same perspective. How about sitting down and having a conversation with them? How about talk? How about talking about the issues? How about trying to see things from a biblical standpoint? Come on. Is anybody hearing what I'm talking about? Here's my biggest concern with the American church. We've just gotten used to it. And so it's not a big deal to feed the hungry. It's not a big deal to care for the widows. It's not a big deal to Reach out to others in need. He says, you've disregarded my commandments. Holiness is now taboo. I'm going to preach this. Look at your neighbor and say, holiness is right. right. Come on, tell somebody on the side, say, holiness is right. I'm not talking about legalism. I'm talking about holiness. I'm talking about letting God wash and cleanse your heart and your mind until the person that you used to be, you are no more. I'm talking about letting God change you to the point to where when you do fall, there's something that comes over you called conviction and you cannot live in that sin. You can't live in that sin. You have to repent before God. The result was, I'm done. They're exploiting the weak. They're cheating on their wives. Sexual immorality, men with men, women with women, worshiping idols. And here's what happened God closed the heavens. And the blessing that they should have received was held back from them. And this prophet stands up. And begins to call this nation into account. And I'm going to pick this up next week to come back and to begin to honor God. To begin to honor one another. And to begin to honor the leadership that he put over them. Now listen, here's the sad part of this story. We all get to the end of Malachi where God says, Bring your tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house and prove me with this and see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you won't have room to receive. And he talks about all the blessing that he's going to bring on them and upon their lives and upon their their, uh, their livelihoods, their, their businesses, their careers, everything they were doing. Everything they touched, God promised to bless. But listen, they disregarded the word of the Lord. And so God shut his mouth for 400 years. For 400 years, there was no record of any consequential word of the Lord being spoken. Look at your neighbor and say, I want to hear his voice. Come on, tell somebody else, say, I want God to speak. How many want to hear from heaven? Wave your hand at me. How many need a word from heaven right now? How many know our nation needs a word from heaven right now? And here's, I'm I'm done. I want you to stand with me. I'm done. Here's, Here's the point. Here's the point. It all began with what they placed value on. Because you see, that's what honor is. In my house, when I was raising my kids, we had two kinds of dishes. We had formal wear. Something Dalton, what Royal Dalton? Something. One of you ladies helped me out. Is that Royal Dalton? Help. Is that? Royal Dalton, okay. We had a china cabinet that had all that expensive chinaware, silverware. And we only used it on Christmas and Thanksgiving, a couple of times on Easter, or when there was somebody really, 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 really important 
that showed up at our house and we wanted to respect and honor and do something really special for them. All of the rest of the time, we used Tupperware. The great thing about Tupperware is you can drop it. It'll bounce right off the floor. You can pick it up and keep using it. You drop the Royal Dalton. Now it's shattered into pieces, and you've got to go on a quest to find something to replace it. And here's what's amazing. The dishware that we used was directly connected to the value that we placed on the people that were using it. And I thought about this later. I'm the most important man in my house. I pay the bills. I bought all of this. Now surely it's a blessing of God. I'm not, I'm not being arrogant and cocky. I'm just, I, I had a moment. I had a moment. And I thought, there's never been a time that I came home and dinner was on the table in Royal Dalton for me. <laughs> but when grandma came over, or when it was Thanksgiving and family was coming in from out of town, we're going to pull out the Royal Dalton. And something hit me. You see, the value that we place on things determine how we treat it. You know, Joe, the Tupperware is in the cabinet. Kids can get to it. You can knock it down. It's, it's just you move it around from one cabinet to it's in the cabinet. The Royal Dalton's got a cabinet all to itself. You don't touch it without permission. And only then on special occasions. Because of the value. What value do you place on your relationship with Jesus? What value do you place on your worship? Do you tithe because you feel pressured? Or do, you do, or do you do it because you love the idea of somebody that hasn't heard hearing that Jesus is the Savior and the Lord of the world and he can change their lives? Do you value the people standing next to you or you... Did you just happen to be in the row that they sat down on this week? Do you value this church? Do you value these leaders? When we take God for granted, we take people for granted. And when we take people for granted, we cut off the blessing. Christian, come here, buddy. I'm done. Listen, I'm done. This is a smart kid right here. I've learned so much just watching his videos. I can't do it yet. <clears throat> but my videos are going to improve when I start doing videos. Because <laughs> actually I'm going to record and let him take care of it. <clears throat> but you know what I've learned just about being around? Is he's got skills and gifts that I will never have. I don't have the patience. I don't have the mental acrimen. I don't have the natural tend. I don't have what it takes. I'm old. Somebody say, you're old school. I'm just old. But there's something God has put in me that he needs. Sometimes he needs encouragement. Sometimes he needs somebody to remind him of the calling and the gift on his life. Sometimes he needs somebody just to tell him he's doing a good job. Proud of him. Hang in there, man. You're making a difference. Your testimony really matters. And here's what I'm trying to get across to you. Look at the person on your right hand or on your left hand. Come on, tell him this. Say, there's something inside of you. Come on, tell him. Say, there's something inside of you. Tell him, say, I need it. This generation needs it. The other people in your life need it. You can be seated. Now hang on. Look, don't, don't sit down. I'm done. I was just talking to Christian. <laughs> but here's the issue, guys. When we dishonor God, we disregard His commandments.
We live however we want. We do whatever we want. There's no accountability. Don't judge me. The truth of the matter is, is one day all of us will stand before God and be judged. And your, your fear should not be somebody else judging you. It should be that the righteous judge will one day examine your life. Don't judge me. We become careless. We live any way we please. We start exploiting and taking advantage of the weak and the hurting. We ignore the plights of those that don't have the same opportunities or blessings that we have. And here's the last part of it. And we then just give whatever our leftovers are. God said, you're bringing me sick and weak and damaged sacrifices and you think you're doing something good. And you're giving me what you have left over. How many of us serve? Don't, don't raise your hands. How many of us serve God that way? We give God whatever's left. Our time, our energy, our effort, our commitment. God says, if you'll honor me, I will open up heaven. I will bless you in such a way that you will have to enlarge your capacity to receive it. Because where you're at will not be able to facilitate what I'm trying to deposit in your life. But if you disregard me, I'll shut my mouth. And he said in the second chapter, I will even curse the very blessing I sought to bring on your life. Somebody says, Pastor Tim, that's the Old Testament. I'm going to talk about that next week. But it's the same principle. Bow your heads with me all over the building. Father, I thank you for every person that's in this house today. And I know this has been a heavy word. But Lord, you're calling us to a higher place. We can't play games anymore. We can't be with washy we can't be undecided we can't be inconsistent we have to push our cards to the table and say we're all in holding nothing back as the old folks used to sing I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back take this whole world but give me Jesus the tears flowed down their face they sang I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. Lord, help us to place that same value on our relationship with you, on your presence, on your goodness, on your love, on our time with you, on our worship, on the lifestyle that we live, the way we interact with other brothers and sisters. Lord, bring our hearts back to where we're not just serving you and worshiping you with our lips, but we're doing it out of the abundance of our hearts. Lord, cleanse our hearts from the clutter and the contamination and the things that we have valued above you. Restore our first love today. We ask it in Jesus' name. I'm not going to keep you more than 30 seconds longer. If you're here today and you say to me, Pastor, I am not where I need to be in my walk with Jesus. Maybe you've never made a commitment to follow the Lord. Or maybe you started and you said, I got off track, but I'm not where I need to be in my walk with Jesus. But I want to get it right today, Pastor. I, I, don't, want, I don't want God to cut off the blessing in my life. I need His goodness. I need His love. I need His mercy. If that's you, hold your hand up. Hold your hand up. That's me. That's me. If you got your hand up, move quickly to an aisle and meet me right here in the front. I want to lay hands on you and pray over you today. Maybe there's somebody here that says, Pastor, I, 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 I'm, I'm pursuing him. I have a relationship with the Lord. I've just, I've just grown lukewarm. I've just grown lukewarm and I want to I want to get back where I need to be in my relationship with the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now I'm going to ask our pastors.
And our elders, make sure you speak with every person that you pray over. Find out where they are. Those that have never made a commitment to follow Jesus or that need to rededicate their lives, make sure you're intentional about praying with them for that. Otherwise, please join me and let's lay hands on everybody that's down here today. Is there anybody else you say, Pastor, I, I need God to rekindle my fire. I, I, need, I, I need to get back to where I need to be. Come quickly and join me down here in the front. Now look at me for just a moment because now I'm going to say something that's going to unsettle a lot of you. Tonight we were planning to have a town hall meeting to talk about the importance of Christians voting. Listen, if you're a Christian, you need to vote. Last election, 30 million Christians did not vote. 30 million Christians. Three times over the last two weeks, God has specifically spoken to me and said, I don't want you to do it that way. He said, I want you to protect the unity of the people that I have brought to you. And I want you to teach them how to have conversations so that they can relate and they can understand and to where even if they disagree, they can do it with honor and respect. Because listen, our nation is so polarized right now. If you're red or if you're blue, there's something wrong with you. And it's amazing how we will trash people and cut them down because their perspective is a little different than ours. Now listen, I believe there are moral issues that we have to have that's the foundation for everything. How many understand what I'm talking about? And those are just not negotiable. I'm sorry, that's just not negotiable. I, you, there's some things you just cannot convince me of. But we still need to be able as a congregation to have dialogue about it without people feeling like, well, if I don't stand where they stand on a particular subject, I can't be part of that church. This is a big tent, folks. We're going, we're, going, we, we're going to reach white, black, Hispanic, Asian, rich, poor, young, old, pretty, ugly, tall, short, wide, narrow, name it. Come on, somebody. Whatever you are, we're going to reach you with the gospel. And hear me, when God changes your heart, your actions will change. Your perspective will change. I know I've been preaching for an hour. But listen, i gotta say, I got to tell you this because it just came back to me by the Holy Ghost. Pastor Sam, I read today, this morning, I was up praying. I read some research that says if you just spend 12 hours a day for eight weeks reading your Bible and praying, your mind will create new neural paths. And your, your, your thinking will dramatically shift in eight weeks. In two months. What would happen if you spent 12 minutes a day in prayer and in the Word? It would change your life forever. Forever. And that's what it's about. Stretch your hands. Let's pray. Would you guys all say this prayer with me? Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me enough to go to the cross to die for my sins. Lord, I know I can't save myself. I can't stop making bad decisions on my own. I can't stop getting myself in trouble but through your help and by the power of the Holy Spirit you can change my heart and God if you change my heart you'll change my life I ask you today to change my heart I ask you to forgive every sin take away all the bitterness the resentment the unforgiveness take away the lust the anger, the greed, the hatred, anything in my heart that does not honor you and glorify you. Wash me, Jesus. Cleanse my heart. 
Renew my mind to your word and change me in your presence today. I choose to follow you. I choose to serve you with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength from this day forward in Jesus' name. Now lift your hands up all over the house and everybody just begin to praise him. Come on, just begin to praise him. Lift your voice to him and begin to worship him right now. Begin to worship him. Team, if you will join me and pray and be, just begin just begin to pray and minister, Gene, if you'd like to help us as well. Any of our, any of our elders, our pastors, please don't let anybody come in this altar without getting prayer today. For everybody else in your seats, would you just stretch your hands just, just for a few minutes? I know it's late. I know you got things to do. But stretch your hands just for a moment and just pray. Just pray for the people that are standing down here in the front. Father, I pray that every yoke of bondage would be broken off of their lives. Lord, I pray that everything the enemy would try to use to bring pain, brokenness, disorder, dysfunction is being broken off of them in Jesus' name. God, I ask you to heal. I ask you to restore. I ask you to reveal the depth of your love and your goodness in their lives. Lord, I ask you to bring forth new beginnings. Show them the brightness of the future that you have prepared for them. Spirit of the living God, change their lives today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Can I get by you, darling? Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. God, I thank you for touching these lives. Lord, touch her today. Today, do a new work in her life today.